My last two videos were concerning the carbon fiber cylinders. As I expected, they were somewhat controversial. I'm not here to condemn or condone Stockton Rush and or Ocean Gate. I'm just looking at the technical aspects of the Titan as objectively as I can. I'm not here to get into the morality, ethics, or legalities. Those are separate issues. I am simply attempting to see both sides of the coin when it comes to the technical aspect. So please leave the none of this would have ever happened if Rush wasn't an ego-blinded butthole that should never use carbon fiber comments to yourself on this one. So to the point of this video, I believe what may have ultimately led to the whole breach is the failure of the real-time monitoring system with respect to how it was implemented and designed. I am relying on the transcript somewhat here. In the next two videos, I will outline the nine reasons why I do not believe that is a fake and also an explanation of the crackling sound. I know very little of the actual details of the real-time monitoring system, but I do know that Russia's patent was largely based on the Kaiser effect. Acoustic emission monitoring is a passive, non-destructive evaluation technique that makes use of the high-frequency acoustic energy emitted by an object that is undergoing stress. This has been widely used for about the last 40 or 50 years in a surprising number of ways for a wide range of applications. The idea of using it with carbon fiber has been around for a while. Rush was not the first guy to pioneer this idea, but he was the first to try using it in a deep submergence vehicle. It was implemented in the Titan using a computer dedicated to full-time monitoring of the status of the, quote, health, unquote, of the carbon fiber hull. There are also 12 acoustic sensors and an unknown number of strain gauges, the use of which is questionable. For either type of sensor, all they could do is tell us what is happening at this instant in time, but in the case of the acoustic sensors, previously recorded data could be compared to the real-time monitoring. This would have basically been a fully automated system. For this system to work, there needs to be sensors which detect ultrasonic pulses or wavelets. This is in turn amplified and analyzed by the computer. If I can find an applicable schematic for this type of amplifier circuit, maybe I'll do an LT spy simulation of it and a quick video about it. Anyway, I assume that custom software had to be written for this task. These wavelets are very weak signals and need to be amplified up to 1 million times while simultaneously trying to filter out extraneous noise. The ocean is a very noisy environment in this regard. The center frequency will vary with the type of material involved. In Russia's patent, the center frequency was 150 kilohertz, which is nearly 10 times higher than the range of human hearing. The idea was that if too much activity was detected, the dive could be aborted, an ascent could be made to a shallower depth, and disaster averted. Rush claimed there was a lot of time before the hole would actually, would actually fail, equivalent to 1,500 meters. On paper, that all sounds good, and in theory, it should work. However, the properties of carbon fiber present a conundrum. Carbon fiber is best understood as its own type of material. The molecular structure is like a polymer. The brittle fracture behavior is like a ceramic. The conductive properties are like a metal. The matrix is plastic, but the fibers are not. This nature of the material puts two things together in a way that is not normally seen. Acoustic emission monitoring is normally used with metals, which by nature have some amount of elasticity, and types of rock which really display seismicity as opposed to elasticity. In the Titan, we have these two things in concert, and interpreting the data seems to be tricky. In the case of carbon fiber, all this system can do is detect fibers breaking in real time. It cannot determine the level of damage or even necessarily where it is. So here are the potential problems I can see with the real-time monitoring system. Were there enough acoustic sensors? Did there need to be more like 48 or 60 of them? Were the sensors sensitive enough? Were they a bit deaf and couldn't hear anything but the loudest noises? Was the software adequately designed for the task? Was it limited by only looking for a certain type of waveform? Was the bandwidth wide enough? Is it possible that the resin was breaking down on a molecular level with every dive and the real-time monitoring system simply couldn't hear it because it was below the frequency range being monitored? Were the acoustic sensors the correct type for the job? 
After the first dive, when you do hear more fibers breaking, how do you know exactly how much damage that represents? Was the real-time monitoring system only looking for carbon fibers breaking? If there was a design flaw with the software, the bandwidth not being wide enough, the implementation of the number and type of acoustic sensors, and the sensors not being sensitive enough, by the time they do detect activity, it could come out like a flood just before a catastrophic failure occurred, not giving them enough time to really do anything about it. Not only that, we are trying to monitor a material with two opposing properties. Seems like a bit of a recipe for disaster. Now, Rush did gather a lot of data from his intentional implosion of the one-third scale holes, so he knew what dying carbon fiber would do and what it would, quote, sound like, but even in that, there are a lot of variables. One last point I'd like to make. This has been a point of contention that on the first dive, they should hear zero fibers breaking, period. Think about it. We live in an imperfect world. We can't manufacture a 100% perfect carbon fiber cylinder with 5-inch thick walls that has zero voids in it. The cylinder probably has literally millions of fibers in it. On the first dive, some of those fibers will break, but if it does not fail at the desired depth, then according to the Kaiser effect, there should be no more noise until you exceed the last maximum. What happens on successive dives is what you really have to pay attention to. If it never stops making noise, as with the 2017 hole, then it just can't be trusted. If it makes noise on the first dive and then on successive dives to the desired depth, it is quiet, as with the 2020 hole, then it can be trusted and the real-time monitoring system takes over and will warn you if any funny business is going on. That was the idea anyway. What throws a wrench into everything is the trinity-like nature of carbon fiber. It can simply fail unpredictably with little or no warning when used in this way. And it could still be that they got everything right with the real-time monitoring system and the carbon fiber simply failed in an unpredictable manner. Exactly how it failed is still a mystery. Was it cyclic fatigue? The real-time monitoring system should have caught that. In conclusion, yes, one could say that carbon fiber is the wrong material, period. I'd agree that with current manufacturing technology, it's best to stay away from it. But I think one day, manufacturing technology may get to the point where it's possible to manufacture carbon fiber submersible that has enough fibers in the correct orientations to be strong enough to actually do the job. However, a whole new technology with no demand for it would have to be developed.